Welcome to The Lex Factor, a lawfully good podcast where we'll brief you on the business of law so you can build a better practice and capture more billable hours. Welcome, everybody, to your next episode of The Lex Factor. We have a great episode for you guys today. We have a surprise co-host. Surprise! Oh, my goodness. It is my friend, Yale. Yale, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Brad. Uh, Hello uh, to the uh, Lex Factor listening audience. Uh, My name is Yale Hollander. I am the senior development strategist at Lexicon. Uh, Basically, what that means is that I work with law firms to grow them both internally and externally. So internally, I help with attorney development uh, with a lot of uh, onboard and getting uh, new attorneys, uh, attorneys new to firms, um, acculturated uh, to the environment that they're going to be practicing in. And then also I help law firms grow externally as well, uh, helping them with quality initiatives and things to help grow their client base, to help retain clients, and also uh, in the recruiting field to help attorneys attract fantastic uh, law firms to attract fantastic attorneys and for fantastic attorneys to be attracted (laughs) to our client law firms. Absolutely. I have to say not to embarrass you. I love your voice. You have the best voice. You have a radio voice. I think you could do, you know, voiceovers, anything like that. I, I, I really, not to embarrass you, I, I have a little crush on your voice. I oh guess. goodness! Well, th- <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I wish, I wish the uh, sponsors of my past failed radio shows on <laughs> on the mighty AM band here in St. Louis uh, would be as equally enamored. But there's always the next time. Next time they're going to hear you here and call you back and say, "What did we do? Huge mistake." There you go. So welcome. It's very. Very nice to have you, Yale. And we have an amazing guest with us today, Molly McGrath. Hey, how are you doing today? Oh, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, I think Yell and I are kindred spirits. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I've been serving in the legal space for 28 years now. Um, I have a company. I'm a founder of Hiring and Empowering Solutions. Uh, there's two sides of my practice where I do staffing and recruiting for law firms. By and large, I work with small solo law firms. I really like to be connected to the heartbeat of the business. And then I have a consulting side of my practice where I take firms through um, my program called the 66 Day Law Firm Turnaround. Wow. How did you get into this? I've, that's, I always get asked that oh, question. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I I moved from New York to Denver when I was at a tender age of 26 years old and um, answered an ad in the classifieds. Do you guys remember those things? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so I answered an ad in a paper for uh, um, to become project manager for an organization called National Network of Estate Planning Attorneys. And um, it was my first job in Colorado. And fell in love, (laughs) fell in love with lawyers and law space when I really would go to back then in 97, we created a coaching program when coaching wasn't even a street term. And I worked with a very well nationally renowned coach that coached attorneys. And I just with them being misunderstood, not having the uh, training in law school on how to manage teams, how to build a business, what have you. And I was hook, line, sinker, became very passionate about it. And then you built what you have today. Yes. I mean, yeah. fantastic. Isn't it amazing how your career starts off in, you know, just a single direction and then it kind of, you know, you you get passionate about something and it kind of leads you to the next and to the next and to the next. It's just, it's so interesting. Uh, Yale, when I was little, I wanted to be a garbage man. I and, and I can I yeah. can see the appeal of yeah, that. Yeah, riding on the back of a truck. Sure. You know, it, it, but you know, my passion it never really took from there. Well. It just you know, I got more into this line of business. I mean, it re- it it does it does require a specialized skill. You have to keep your head 
in front of the opening That's of right. the back of the garbage truck. Otherwise, right. it's an entirely different um, uh, aroma profile. Right. We yes, say. that is true. The wrong kind of aromatherapy. Now, something that I want to address with our guest is that I read in a book that you are a pain. <laughs> and oddly, the book was your book. And pain is an acronym. Can you talk about that for a second? <laughs> yes, I always tell people I uh, am a professional nag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and th actually that's what really got me to a place of creating. I have written three books actually for the legal space. And that really what was the breeding ground for becoming that professional nag, if you will. <laughs> and I coined the term entrepreneur in an entrepreneur's world. And I wrote a book. I'd so often, this is where I really became passionate about the legal space. Um, attorneys would come to these conferences and you'd go have the breakout sessions and you'd go to the coffee during the 15 minute break. And I would be roaming the halls and hearing them consistently complaining about their employees. Business would be great, but for the employees. And then we'd the team would come out because they brought their team to the events as well. And the team would constantly say, business would be great, but for the clients. Can't get my work done because the clients are constantly interrupting me. And I realized there was a massive breakdown in regards to how to build a successful law firm, build a successful business. And a lot of it was that the employees were consistently just, they had the mindset that their entrepreneur wanted them to come into work, keep your mouth shut, put your head down, collect your paycheck and go home. Well, that's what was happening. And then at five o'clock, people are packing up and out the door. And then the entrepreneur is there for another four or five hours or what have you at night, the attorney and feeling like that, you know, they will work for everybody else and that nobody cares as much as they do. So that's really when I got very passionate about bringing everybody onto the same playing field and getting employees to become that professional nag to become, because not only do your entrepreneur need it, they actually depend on it. Right. It's an important aspect. Absolutely. And the acronym PAIN, Professional Accountability Implementation NAG. Now, speaking uh, as, as somebody who has um, walked in the shoes of a number of different pieces of the, the law firm puzzle. I was a litigator for a decade. I was in uh, various levels of management. After that, I uh, was a sole proprietor for a while, and then I've worked in the corporate space for about the last dozen years. Uh, accountability to a lawyer, especially a lawyer employee, an employee of a law firm, uh, doesn't mean what accountability to an entrepreneur would mean. Accountability in the law sense is avoiding bar complaints, not getting sued for malpractice, <laughs> whereas they really kind of don't even think about the accountability to the enterprise that they're working for. So it's great to have people like you out there who can wake both the entrepreneur and the workforce up to what accountability really means. So that's that's fantastic. I love the acronym. Thank you. You know, it, it's interesting. Human beings don't like being told what to do and when to do it, especially entrepreneurs and especially attorneys. But if you can create the framework and have the conversation about the accountability is actually to the client so you don't get the our complaints and things of that nature. The accountability is to the calendar. So go the calendar, so go cash flow. And if you can kind of shift it in regards to where the accountability is to the vision, it is to the profitability, it is to delivering on your promises in the marketplace. And when the employee really understands that their role, there's so much value in that to supporting your attorney, maybe especially I do a lot with human assessments and things of that nature. Most attorneys are either very, very high fact finders where they live in consistent analysis paralysis and they consistently live in a deferred to deflect mindset. And, you know, what's the standard attorney response to any question? 
It depends. So it's when your team member really understands how a, a attorney is hardwired or the flip side, they're very entrepreneurial and they are, have the attention span of a bed bug and they want one <laughs> always on the hunt for the new shiny new toy. And so they consistently need to be backed against the wall where the stakes are high. They operate best as last minute Larry or Linda, and they know that they need a tremendous amount of chaos for their greatest creativity to come out, understanding your human design of your attorney, and then creating the accountability. And we have to think, I, I have to think, social media and the awareness around the coaching and people that, especially attorneys that are now investing in coaching and really understanding that accountability is not taking away their freedom or their creativity, but it, in fact, it's there to support it. Because if they could just focus for an hour and review documents and they get the rest of the seven seven hours of their day to go ha to create and to be the entrepreneur, whatever it is that they their highest use of their time is. Right. It's very empowering. You know, if you can accomplish that, then you can focus in other areas. I love yeah. all of the different phrases. I feel like you're coining. Uh, what, what did you say, Larry? and uh, Last minute Larry. Yeah, Linda. last minute Larry. <laughs> I love that. Well, one of the other things that you had uh, coined is the 66-day law firm turnaround. Could you talk just a little bit more about that? Why 66 days? How did you come up with it? Kind of just the background with that. Yeah, so six. I've been in coaching. I've had a coach for since '97. I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of phenomenal coaches in this uh, legal space, by and large. And for a long time, it was takes 30 days to build a habit. Mm -hmm. Well, then new studies came out that it created, it took 66 days. And I was seeing all these coaches that were creating these 90 day programs or 90 day this, what have you. And I would notice in other organizations I was involved in, it was too long. It was creating, the attorney was losing interest. Um, they weren't seeing progress fast enough. So they were, you know, losing faith in the process or in the coach, what have you. And so I started taking law firms through this to test it, to see if really in 12 weeks with a tremendous amount, again, of accountability, key performance indicators and consequences, um, if people had their feet, their knew the rule books and had their feet held to the fire every single week, could you really create a turnaround in your people, your process, your production, and your profitability? And yes, it is possible. So I break it into those four areas because by and large, those are the four areas after all the years of getting phone calls and emails and being in the conference halls with attorneys way back when we used to travel to conferences. Um, this is what I would hear from them. It really broke down to those four main areas. And it wasn't marketing. Attorneys usually are not worried about marketing by and large until they get to a certain point in their practice. But you have to have these four areas um, really systematized and working and running consistently and persistently. Um, otherwise, if you get more leads and more clients or what have you, it's, it's, it's going to cause more headaches. We talked a little bit about accountability and, you know, the importance of that. In this uh, next topic, you talked about holding people's feet to the fire, which is so important. Do you find generally in a law firms, is it somebody higher up like a partner that is holding the people's feet to the fire? Is it self-accountability? How do you coach people? Is it where does the accountability lie? It's, it's self-accountability. I love that you picked. I always start off before I will take anyone on as a client. I will talk about self-governing mm -hmm. that people have to be. It can't be the managing partner. It can't be the attorney. That's when they begin to resent their business or resent their employees or feel like their, you know, employees need to be uh, self-governing and, and professional babysitters. In fact, it's the opposite. So when it, I do talk very, 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 very upfront about accountability and consequences and not consequences in the way that it's used as shame and blame or mm -hmm. weapon, right. but in a way that it's our greatest gift that we, we need that as professionals. You know, why does the health industry make so much money? There's a very big difference between the person walking out of the gym that is they're on their own self plan and the other person that's writing a check for a trainer every single day. And if they don't show up, there's going to be hell to pay for it. So I, I can't be on the attorney. The goal of any 
you know, my goal is always to free up the attorney, let them be the entrepreneur and let them practice law and be client facing and doing what they do best in regards to managing people. Because in law school, you're not trained how to run a business or how to run people. So let them be the visionary, let them be able to be the attorney or the managing attorney or the entrepreneur, depending on what seat they're sitting in at that time. When I think of the term term, Turnaround, especially in the business context, um, you know things you know pop into my head like uh, like say J.C. Penny, um, or you know maybe like a, a, a sports team that that's faltering. And when I think turnaround, I think wholesale change of of management, uh, all kinds of drastic moves and things like that in order to move the ship in in the right direction. Now, clearly, um, you know, somebody, especially in a small company, um, they can't afford to have that kind of um, turmoil. They can't afford to have that kind of churn. Um, so number one, how do you convince a, a potential client for your services um, that this isn't going to be a, a catastrophic uh, turnover situation in the turnaround? And also, how does, how does a client come to terms with the fact that they are in need of turnaround? What, what should potential clients be looking for as far as making the determination that it's time to start thinking about a turnaround? Mm. You know, I studied that term intently and um, I'm still even uh, studying it and, and consistently to make sure, is it the right terminology and is it the right message I want to convey? Because for so long, people were selling transformation. They were selling breakthroughs. They were selling 10X your practice here and there. And it seemed completely daunting. And the reason it came up with the word turnaround and the way that it resonates with me and the way I communicate it with my clients is that it's not like coming in and throwing a bomb in the room and disrupting everything within your firm. It is the ability where truly, you know, kind of thinking of that book, Good to Great, of moving people uh, different. They might be the wrong person in the wrong role. They need a different seat within the bus. And that's the essence of what I took from what I was hearing from people is a, a turnaround doesn't sound like turmoil or transformation or massive upheaval within the firm. So it, it's really, you know, a pivot, but that's a term that people are using over and over again, but it's a two millimeter shift is what the turnaround means for me. Cause it's not about cutting people out. It's not completely, you know, what, what's the saying of decision when you decide you cut off all other possibility. A turnaround for me really communicates there's an opportunity for uh, for possibility. And it's just a shift. It's a two millimeter shift in the areas. And by and large, that's what's needed after you get in there and do a deep dive into what's not working. It's a 66 day turnaround, but you talk in terms of 12 weeks. You know as well as I do that a <laughs> lot of principles of law firms don't think along the lines of 66 days being 12 weeks. They think of 12 weeks as being 84 days. So is the message there that there there has to be uh, room uh, to, to take a break, even if necessarily the work itself, the substance of the law firm's operations don't necessarily take time off, that the process behind the turnaround uh, do respect the five-day work week while, yes, that's, while that's still a thing? <laughs> yeah, most of my law firms, I actually, it's one of the things we encourage go to four day work week, actually, um, first and foremost, but it includes time for us to do the strategic deep dive within that. So the first, you know, two weeks or what have you, we're getting our game plan. It's a locker room huddle before we go on this Super Bowl playing field. 
So we kick off with the three-hour VIP session. They do a tremendous amount of homework before, then bring it to us and we get into a Zoom room and we go through it with all decision makers that need to be. And then we create our strategic roadmap from there. Then it takes time to have a conversation, get the buy-in from the employees, talk about it, present it to them, and then create this strategic roadmap of what we are doing every single week, which starts with every Monday doing a locker room huddle where we do a weekly stakeholders meeting and we are all in service to that plan. Again, it gets to, we might get two weeks down and figure out that wasn't the right route. We got to pivot, we got to move, or we got to kill that deal, what have you. So it does allow for the lead up time. And then when it's go time, to then uh, we have all the data and the information. We're just, we're not just making reckless decisions. I want to go back to the self-accountability. Um, that is the hardest thing I've found in management to teach people. Do you ever just run into individuals that just cannot get that self-accountability, that they just can't grasp that concept of looking inwardly and saying, you know what, I can be better here, here, and here. Do you, how do you get past that block? Yeah, you can't with some people. I run into it every single day. So a big portion of my practice is um, hiring and staffing. And through our um, interviewing process, that's where we f- find how coachable people are, how much they value accountability, how self-governing they are, um, things that nature. It's very clear in the beginning. So then when you get into a business and you figure out and you start talking to people and interviewing people, uh, yeah, I see it more often than not, thankfully, not so much in this day and age because people are investing in personal and professional mm-hmm. development, but it starts with a coaching mindset. I, I'll start right off with hitting people square in the eyes with some pretty hard conversations and questions during my interviewing process to see how they respond or react mm-hmm. to those. And that's very telling. So I, I would find that more often than not, most human beings don't come from a coaching culture. Most human beings were not growing up with mentorship and leadership and what have you. And when I say that, I mean, employees, entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. invest in that. They seek it out. But employees, unless they had the pleasure and the honor to belong to organizations because right now you're dealing with all the jobs that they had before they came to you mm-hmm. and what, what, you know, what kind type of trauma stories or leadership or mentorship that they had before. And so a lot of times it's like figuring out where their triggers are and what their trauma are. And if they will be able to, you know, have honest, well, respectful conversations, if they're not afraid of their own voice, if they have a value for planning, if they have a value for coaching and feedback, you know, if they, they'll use terminology like criticism versus coaching, Mm -hmm. they'll use, you can pay attention to people's language and the way that they see the world. um, And it'll tell you very quickly if they have a, hold a high, high value for self-accountability, for accountability, and if they innately are Mm self-accountable. Not to uh, put you on the spot and perfectly okay for you to decline this uh, request, but what is one of the questions that you ask in the interview that kind of guides you towards understanding if they have self-accountability? Great question. And I can just think off the top of my head in Mm -hmm. regards to that. When I ask them, tell me a little bit about how you structure your day, number one, and how you over communicate with your boss in regards to the value that you create for them. (laughs) I like it. It's really fascinating (laughs) to see how people, you know, because if they're accountable, one of the things I have my client, my employees of my clients do is send a daily snapshot report. When you have a value for over communicating and consistently coming to people with proposed solutions versus constant problems. And that's the second question I ask. Give me an example of how in your current job right now that you are consistently coming to your boss with proposed solutions versus constant problems. Yeah, I could definitely see how those questions uh could throw somebody off right at the beginning and you could tell if they're unable to answer or struggle that, yeah, maybe they don't have that self-accountability or or they're more in tune with just complaining or relying on somebody else to come up with solutions. 
So I definitely like that a lot. You can tell it very, very quick too. You can tell on, honestly where they're consistently delegating back up. Right. Absolutely. So very last question and kind of ending thoughts for the podcast here. Uh, what would be your uh, greatest piece of advice for, you know, owners out there, COOs, uh, you know, managing partners, however, that they stay awake and that they really pay attention to understand that they need this turnover or that they're not surprised or this turnaround, I'm sorry, or this uh, you know, not surprised with individual things that may pop up that this doesn't catch them off guard. What advice would you give them to kind of be mindful of this situation? Well, I'd say first and foremost, if they make certain that they have that weekly stakeholders meeting, and um, I'd be happy to share my agenda that I have with your listeners where they can go through their top priorities for the week, what's working, what's not working, where they're jammed up, also making certain that they conduct a quarterly employee growth plan where their employees are. My growth plan is I had the employees do a self-evaluation of, and, and it's pretty intense. Um, and then have the entrepreneur do an evaluation. Then when they come together, it's treated like a coaching and a leadership conversation. I just did a presentation this morning um, in regards to, you know, we're, right now employee retention is a very big deal. You know, employees, if they are not feeling, you have to remember you're in the H to H business, human to human. Mm. First and foremost, you are hiring human beings first human doing second. And it's the human being stuff that typically destroy the relationship in the business culture, you know, whether somebody leaves or they get fired or what have you. And so you have to remember that they need time, attention, and feedback. And your job as an entrepreneur is really truly to be a strategic mentor. If you are giving your employees time, attention, and feedback, and I know we're all busy and we have very jam-packed client calendars, what have you, but making certain that you are even just giving them five minutes, you know, during the week at the water cooler, or the coffee, or what have you, and checking in with them and then making sure you have a structure, either your professional law firm administrator, your CEO, COO, whatever term you have in there, is consistently spending time with people and giving them that time, attention and feedback because that's the number one thing that I attorneys uh, business owners you have to shift your mind constantly I will hear from them I don't have time to fill in the blank train you know do this do that when it comes to employees I want someone with batteries included and in this day and age you have to shift your mindset around that you have to invest in them and realize that if you treat them well you know my my I'll just say this real quick I will my my inbox for recruiting the subject line of email number one is are you happy and being treated well at where you are right now question mark my favorite is when um, employees will reply, they won't even talk to a recruiter and they're like, I love where I'm at, not interested. I'll go as far as find the law firm that they're working for, try to find the man managing attorney and send them an email and say, whatever you are doing, keep doing it and up level it because your employees won't even talk to recruiters and that's unheard of. Wow. Hmm. I love that. Absolutely. So do you want to... Uh take an opportunity to tell us a little, just a little bit about your podcast? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it's my favorite thing that I get to do. I drop a podcast every Tuesday and um, our my podcast, I try to speak into the listening of both the entrepreneur as well as the employee and get them speaking the same language. So we I'll have guests all the time, um, people in regards to the psychology field and mindset field. We're talking about communication, leadership, operations, um, process, production, um, hiring, firing sometimes, mm -hmm. <laughs> onboarding, and really how to create an empowering culture. I love it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure having you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. And that is another episode of The Lex Factor. Please make sure to like us and we're available anywhere that you subscribe. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to The Lex Factor. Lexicon takes care of business so you can take care of law. Learn how to build a better practice at lexiconservices.com. <laughs>